Welcome to Content with Character, the weekly podcast that'll give you the momentum you need to create content with more ease, clarity, and laughter. I'm your host, content copywriter Emily Aborn, and I'm all about unconventional marketing approaches. I believe in your big ideas, and I'm excited to help you share them in a way that's distinctly you. Hi, welcome, welcome, welcome back. As I said in last week's episode on bios, this month is all about going as in-depth with value as fast as we possibly can. So today we're headed in and out so you can get back to all you have going on right now. But of course, I still want you to feel refreshed and like this was helpful for you. So today we're going to be touching on the topic of perfectionism. And most relevantly for this show, uh, we're going to talk about perfectionism as it relates to your business, to your content, to your marketing, to your collaborations, to your relationships, and the myriad of other places that perfectionism rears its head. We're going to talk about the different types of perfectionism and open up some awareness to just like where it might be getting in our way so that we can ease up on it, loosen up. Now, my goal with this episode is really just to help you ease up on perfectionism 1%. I want you to make more progress with less judgment. I want you to make more connection with less focus on having to have things perfect. Perfectionism as a trait maybe isn't such a terrible thing on the surface, but I do think that it can be really problematic when it continuously slows us down or uh, gets in the way of our team and the people that we're working with feeling good and connected to us. So we are going to be short and sweet today. Um, I always, of course, like to still introduce myself at the top of the episode, just in case this is your first time listening. I'm Emily Aborn. I'm your, uh, I don't let perfectionism stop me too often, but sometimes it does anyway, host of this show. I'm also a content copywriter. And in my personal life, I'm a wife, auntie, sister-in-law, daughter, dog mom, sister, friend, and uh, I wear a lot of hats. And just like you, I am just over here. I am over here doing my best. So this summer, a friend and I have um, taken it upon ourselves to embark on Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, together. Now, the reason I say embark is because it really is kind of a a self-discovery course, I would say. Um, You kind of work through each week and it has activities and opportunities for reflection and journaling and things like that. So I'm currently 10 weeks in out of 12. I have been absolutely loving it. And if you are a writer or an artist or a creative or just somebody who really likes personal growth and self-reflection, I definitely do recommend this book. You should know that it is some seriously hard work in addition to some seriously hard playing. (laughs) It's a big commitment to yourself. Um, It's a great, it's, it's really good for like building a habit and a ritual. And I think that it has also welcomed in a lot of opportunity to experience more joy and also freedom to just kind of like lay down a little bit of that heavy burden of the inner critic. Because I don't know about you, but my inner critic, they like to put some some weight on my shoulders. You know what I mean? Uh, throughout like my pretty much my entire life. So it's a good opportunity to kind of put some of that down. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. So uh, we, we won't belabor on that. Okay. Um, on page 119, Julia starts getting into the topic of perfectionism. And I couldn't really even like begin to sum up. Like when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't really sum it up or say it nearly as eloquently as she did in my own words. And I also don't think that would be the right thing to do. So I am just going to read it to you. Okay, today's story time. Okay, so I'm on page 119. Tilly Olson correctly calls it the knife of the perfectionist attitude in art. You may call it something else, getting it right. Or you may call it fixing it before I go any further. You may call it having standards. What you should be calling it is perfectionism. Perfectionism has nothing to do with getting it right. It has nothing to do with fixing things. It has nothing to do with standards. It is a refusal to let yourself move ahead. It is a loop, an obsessive, debilitating, closed system that causes you to get stuck in the details of what you're painting or writing or making and to lose sight of the whole. 
perfectionists fix one line of a poem over and over until no lines are right. They redraw the chin line on a portrait until the paper tears. They write so many versions of scene one that they never get to the rest of the play. For the perfectionists, there are no first drafts, rough sketches, warm-up exercises. Every draft is meant to be final, perfect, set in stone. The perfectionist is never satisfied. The perfectionist never says, this is pretty good. I think I'll just keep going. To the perfectionist, there's always room for improvement. Okay, and then lastly, perfect perfectionism is not a quest for the best. It is a pursuit of the worst in ourselves. The part that tells us that nothing we will ever do is good enough and that we should try again. No, no, we should not. I saw a meme recently on Instagram that I thought was funny. It said, I think my problem is that I'm both a perfectionist and also not very good. <laughs> and I think that nobody uh, has ever summed up how I feel in life better than that. Um, so I'm so not good that before reading this chapter of The Artist's Way, I would have said, well, I'm not a perfectionist because I'm not that good. I'm not perfect. And I create imperfect garbage all of the time. I'm definitely not a perfectionist. But the truth is, I have this feeling. When she said that every draft is supposed to be the final draft, or you have this feeling that every draft is supposed to be the final draft, that really stood out to me. Because I do. I have this belief that there is some sort of perfect out there to attain. Now, I don't let it slow me down most of the time. I push out messy stuff. I move through it. Um, This podcast, case in point. But but it internally, it bothers me. It frustrates me to no end that it is not perfect. This very episode, funny enough, this is my second go at it. Uh, when I sat down originally to do it, it was a day that I was like highly distracted and all over the place and I was not pleased with the outcome. I felt I had not given it my best. I felt it was not up to like my standard. So that's not what I'm talking about. I am not talking about not giving things our best, not having things up to a high standard. Perfectionism is really when it like already is a very high standard. It already is your best but you just keep on editing or fixing or rewriting or re-recording or overdoing or redoing or getting extremely frustrated with yourself or others when it is not perfect. It is a bad place to be and uh, it's very, very painful. So I had this idea for us. Now, this comes from, a, it's a little spin. Um, a colleague of mine, Teresa Schloop of Caffeine Creative, she's a website designer, she and I work together very closely and she shared this idea with me recently that when when she wants to learn a new skill or a new habit, rather than like approaching it in this huge, overwhelming, insurmountable way where it's like this giant goal out there, she just works on it 1% at a time. So every day she'll take 1% action towards that thing. And I loved that. I've done it so much without even like having the words to be able to put to it. But I also thought it could apply to uh, other things in our life. So for example, you know, not just in business or not just trying to learn something or not just a goal. It could be if a relationship in your life is like a little little wonky, a little out of whack, can you just take 1% of a step closer to that person today. Or maybe you can work to find 1% uh, mutual understanding. Um, maybe those changes on your website, you could just make 1% at a time. And then of course, like she says, something new you wanna learn, you just take 1% step towards learning it, building the skill, or um, stopping or starting the habit. So I thought it was also fun to just kind of like try this throughout my life. And I actually ended up experimenting for a whole week. I was like, I'm just going to try to be like a 1% better version of myself in various pieces of my life. And of course, after that experiment, I wrote about it. So if you are interested, I'll include a link to that. But let's go back to 1% and how it relates to perfectionism. So in Julia Cameron's book... 
There is a daily activity that she has you do called the morning pages. Some of you already know what this is, but basically it's a three full page free writing session that you do every single day. And it is your unedited, non-filtered, just write, 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 write. It takes me a half an hour to do it every day. And I'll tell you what, what has come pouring out of those morning pages, most definitely not perfect. The goal is not perfect. To make it perfect, the goal is to, there's no goal, but the idea is to really bring your dreams, your desires, your truths to life, and also turn down the noise of the inner critic telling you that you spelled necessary wrong again. Listen, inner critic, nobody can spell necessary, okay? No one, so shut it. (laughs) Anyway, while doing, ironically, while doing the perfectionist chapter, or the piece with perfectionism in it, I was having a really busy week and two of the days I was not able to do 100% of my morning pages. Now, it was pretty darn close. Okay, I think one day I did like two and three quarters of a page and one day I hit like two and a half and then I had to go get ready for the rest of my day. I was sharing this with the friend I'm doing it with, how annoyed and agitated I was. The imperfection of not completing every activity in the book made me really, really frustrated. And then I realized the irony and humor in all of this, and I just had to kind of like laugh at myself. So in putting together this episode, I was thinking for those who struggle with perfectionism or perfectionist tendencies, can we just turn it down 1%? Like, can we give ourselves permission to not get 100% on all the things all the time? Maybe it's 1% Every time you feel like you want to just crop that thing one more time, maybe it's 1% overall, but the goal is like, can we just turn this down 1%? I think knowing other perfectionists, uh, I think that your house is not going to become an instant disaster if you ease up on yourself just 1%. I do not think that your podcast is going to turn out awful if you work to make it 99% ready to go instead of 100%. I think that the Canva graphic you have spent hours and hours on can stand to be 1% less perfect. And I think that your social media post is still going to be amazingly high quality if it takes you just 1% less time to edit. So like I said, perfectionism in and of itself, it's not coming from a bad place. It's not a bad thing. There are many, many reasons for it. And I think that desiring perfection isn't like some sign that something is wrong with us. In fact, it has like weirdly good pieces of it. Like it could be a reflection of high standards or an eye for detail or a strong appreciation for beauty, for quality, for impeccable follow through or really good communication, right? It might reflect your goal oriented, your task focused, your forward thinking, your innovative. You are always trying to make things better in this world. Yay you, yay us. Look at all these fantastic traits of perfectionism. But I'm kidding. Uh, It also can have some really unwanted side effects, like it can cause incredible amounts of procrastination, Uh, moving at a pace that's so slow you never achieve anything you set out to do in time. It can cause you not to start in the first place, never to share, never to feel ready, never to feel good enough, smart enough. It can cause you to burn out because it takes a heck of a lot of energy to keep all that up there. Uh, It can cause overthinking, analysis paralysis, fear of delegating, fear of asking for help, low self-esteem. It strains the creative process and it strains and hurts your relationships. I know it's like the warning on a drug label. It's like it'll take care of your skin issue, but the side effects won't ever let you leave your house again. So the goal here is just like, can we turn down the perfectionism just one notch? Okay, just 1%, especially as we are getting ready to plan and prep for fall and we're like, probably in some cases re-engaging with this business and marketing and collaborators and all of that jazz. So in prepping for the podcast, I found a ton of examples of the types of perfectionism, like the forms that it can take. And I picked out three 
that I thought we would just touch on. But then what I really specifically want to get into is like how they can actually show up in our collaborations, our content creation, marketing, relationships with our business, uh, with people in our business, sorry. And the reason I picked these three are because they're easy to explain. They're also easy to see within ourselves and easy to see the, the mark that they might leave. Now, what they are not is easy to work on (laughs) or to let go of. So the ones I chose, and like I said, there are a lot of them, are self-oriented perfectionism, other-oriented, socially prescribed. So we're going to breeze through kind of what they all mean, and then we'll get into like how they actually show up. So self-oriented perfectionism, that's when you set extremely high standards for your own self and you are striving for perfectionist perfection in every single task. It's kind of self-explanatory, but like you answer to you and you are a serious boss, a critic with like world's hardest to please palette. Then we have other oriented perfectionism. This is when you hold other people to other to unrealistic standards and you're really super duper critical of their performance. Now this one caught my attention for a couple of reasons. At first I was like, oh no, no, this is not me at all. I definitely don't do this ever. But I think that I actually do with a couple of people in my life and around certain things. And for the most part, I don't care what other people do. Some Sometimes people will have me over their house and they're like, oh my gosh, your house is so clean and mine's so messy. Please ignore the mess. I'm like, I literally don't see it. I do not care. I try really hard not to inflict like my version of perfect or idealism onto somebody else. But I can see instances where that is not the case. I know a lot of people that do this in their life to a lot of others in their life. They do it in many facets. They have zero tolerance for imperfection in others. And they don't mind letting you know in so many words. It is intense, I tell you. And best of luck to all of us in their wake. (laughs) So perfectionism type number two. Other-oriented perfectionism. That's when you hold others to unrealistic standards and are critical of their performance. Perfectionism type three uh, that I chose was socially prescribed perfectionism. Now, this one's interesting. It's really like this belief that others have high expectations of you And then you feel really, really pressured to meet those expectations. And definitely my hand is raised here. I mean, in some cases, I think that we do have social norms and like, quote unquote, versions and perfect uh, of perfect and like labels and expectations slapped on us that we somehow feel pressured to meet. But I also think in some cases, these don't actually exist, but we think they do. So we make them exist. Either way, it doesn't actually matter. It's a pressure to show up and meet some unknown standard or mark outside of you or some assumed, I should say, standard or mark outside of you. It kind of reminds me of some of what we talked about in that people-pleasing episode I did recently. And like with people-pleasing, it's not like innately bad to want to fit in, right? It's not innately bad to want to make others happy or to please them or have them like you. But it's important to remember that there is no perfect that is going to make everybody happy or even really the person you think you're making happy, happy. In fact, in many cases, one version of perfect is so very much not another version of perfect. So we're trying to conform to this like outside standard, which in most cases, it's like an ever changing and very impossible to hit mark. And it's a hard, hard place to be. Um, So the two kind of ways to look at perfectionism or the two ways I should say it can like show up and express itself are either covertly or overtly. Now, I should also say I'm not like a perfectionist expert. (laughs) I'm just realizing some of these traits in myself that I kind of didn't know were there before. So covert and overt. And basically what I'm trying to say here is it doesn't, it's not always front and center and you're not always going to instantly see it or instantly identify it in both yourself and in others. And that's where this concept around covert versus overt comes in. 
Covert is like this internal striving for perfection. You may never even openly express it. You may never even let it like control you, but you still let and feel the stress and self-criticism kind of like eat you from the inside out. And then we have overt. And that really is when there's a very open expression for perfection, right? You're like, you're actively showing frustration when things either aren't going how you anticipated them to go for yourself or for other people. And you may be sitting there like fixing and fixing and fixing and editing and editing and editing. So all that to say, whether you bottle up your tendencies, whether you let them out and have their heyday, either way, it's, it's helpful to us to turn down this noise of perfectionism just like 1%. Okay, let's just turn it down 1%. We can all stand to be 99% perfect instead of 100% perfect. <laughs> so let's look at just like real quick where it can cause us trouble in our content, our marketing, our relationships, and also our collaborations in our business. In our content creation, it can be like this reluctance to publish content until it feels absolutely perfect, which you can imagine causes delays and in some cases, missed opportunities. I'm thinking of like pitching yourself, right? Um, It also, I've seen people un or over edit out the humanness of their content. They spend so much time editing, like every single uh, um, uh, like, but uh is gone. And there's just like no more humanness. It's just like very robotic content Um, that could be written. It could be verbal. The other way that this shows up in content creation is criticizing other people, criticizing team members or collaborators in the like creation process, which can lead to a really tense environment, also reduce the morale, not to mention they might actually just like fear doing things wrong, depending on how intensely this this kind of is expressing itself. Um, constantly worrying about what, uh, what your audience thinks on the other side, like what the feedback's going to be or fearing negative criticism or fearing that somebody's going to find a typo that can like get in your head and just like lead you to, uh, creative blocks, uh, anxiety, stress, and not putting anything out in the first place. Um, and then like internally obsessing over every detail, always feeling dissatisfied with your work, even if you're not vocalizing it or you're not letting yourself get like super mired in it. It could just be this internal obsession. And then lastly, I think this can show up as like, if you are looking for help with your content creation or your copy, for example, you might just like really have trouble micro, uh, not micromanaging everything, asking for help and getting solutions to your, your problem or what you're struggling with. It's exhausting. It can lead to decreased productivity, stop you before you do the right thing and um, lead to burnout, honestly. In collaborations and relationships, uh, perfectionism shows up in um, like like if you don't delegate, your collaborations can end up going really, really badly. Either you take on way too much or the other person feels completely dismissed, mistreated, undervalued. I don't know. A whole range of things can happen. Something else can happen entirely. It's really not a good picture in collaborations and in relationships. And if you are constantly or I am constantly critical of somebody else's performance or I'm always like editing and fixing their work behind their back, it makes us really, really challenging to work with, causes a lot of stress and strain throughout the relationship. Um, I think it's a choice we have to make when working with other people. Do I want connection or do I want perfection? Do I want collaboration or do I want perfection? Do I want progress or do I want perfection? It's really hard to achieve the former of all of those with the side effects of the latter perfectionism taking over the scene. So how do we, how do we turn down the roar of perfectionism? It is so loud and so mighty. And I, I wish I had a one quick, like five minute answer for you, but I don't. <laughs> what I do have are just a couple of ideas. And I think that it's just like when we work on any other habit or skill, we just kind of have to do it 1% at a time, 1% letting go of control all the time. And again, I'm saying all of this to myself just as much as you. 
Here are some ideas I had to like support yourself while you're working on letting go of that 1%, okay? Number one, surround yourself with competent, skilled, trustworthy people who you are like, you know what? I could delegate and collaborate and work with them. So you're gonna wanna build a team around you that definitely has high standards, but like any team, they're not going to be perfect. And that's where you have to get people in that environment who are like, maybe going to give you some feedback and not let that perfectionism sabotage the progress or, um, they're, they're going to let you know, you know, this isn't you connecting with us. This isn't a collaborative environment. So you do want to make sure that people around you that you're working with are skilled and qualified to do what you're entrusting them with and that maybe they're okay. Like you give them permission to speak up when that is not being, that is not happening. Number two is to keep in mind that your version of perfect is not anyone else's. And I guarantee you they have their own version in some area of life that is not yours. What you care about being perfect is not what somebody else might care about being perfect. So in in general, as a rule, don't inflict your perfect on somebody else. Number three is I love this and I do this often in my life, like experiment with small things. What does it feel like to not fold all the laundry in one day? What does it feel like to not have that entire task done A to Z all at one time? What does it feel like if you didn't finish a book or if you didn't get through the course you signed up for 100% because you weren't interested or you didn't have time? What does it feel like to get a, a 99 on the test instead of 100 so experiment with like small, low stake things and it can help you to kind of like let go a little bit. Um, and then the, the other one I mentioned before, like in a collaborative setting, but I think anybody in your life who can offer honest feedback about like where you need to hold them and where you need to fold them around perfectionism. Uh, maybe it's somebody on your team. Maybe it's a spouse, a coach, a mentor, just somebody who helps you explore a little bit more and feels like they have permission to step in and say, hey, you might want to consider lightening up on this one. You know, like here's an area where you might try lightening up a little bit. So do a little exploring on where perfectionism shows up for you. Does it primarily come up around yourself and what you expect yourself to be? Is it something you expect from other people? What is sort of going on under the surface? Where do you, where does it originate, I guess, for you? And where is it maybe like serving you, but then also definitely not serving you? And in the places it's not serving you, that's where I would encourage you to do a little exploring in letting up on that 1%. Especially in business, we cannot be everything to everyone. Uh, and everybody is going to be kind of like walking around with their own definition of quote unquote what perfect means. So I personally have to remind myself of this like mm, pretty much every five minutes. And what I keep on coming back to is just who do I value or sorry, what do I value? Who am I? Uh, what do I think? What do I feel? What do I want? What do I need? And who am I really wanting to talk to and, and resonate with? Like, I want to focus on talking to them. I want just one person at a time. I'm not out here trying to create for everyone. Just one person. My biggest fan. Somebody who loves me no matter what. Who rejoices in my imperfections. I'm speaking to them. And when I do that, when I kind of like let go of that need to try to be everything to everyone and perfect in every single person's eyes and my own, it helps me to show up and speak a little bit more specifically, a little bit more clearly, confidently, and yes, of course, imperfectly. So like I said, I'm not like a perfectionist expert. I'm not a coach. I'm definitely not a therapist, not by a long shot. 
But I hope that this sort of just helped you a tiny bit because maybe it show maybe it shined a little bit of light on how this shows up for you in your business. So you can turn down that noise of perfectionism just 1%. We're just going for 1%. So that's it for today. Next week, we're going to be talking about something along a similar uh, vein, but it's how to ask for help. And specifically in your business, because I'm not an expert in getting your children to pick up their laundry and put away their toys. But I do have some pointers for you that will help you in asking for help in your business. All right, that's it for today. And if you want an extra little bonus this week, uh, I put a little journaling prompt in the um, show notes this week for you. So you can have some fun with that. And I'm going to keep that a surprise and chat with you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Content with Character. If you loved the episode, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate, review, and share it with someone else you know it could help. For more content and visibility tips, visit my blog at emilyaborn.com. And be sure to connect with me on Instagram at emilyaborn. I'd love to hear how this inspired you to take action.